What's up, everybody? Today, I'm bringing you my top 10 pickups of 2020. Stay tuned, because this is a killer list. What's going on, everybody? It's Comics for Cheap, and today I'm showcasing my top 10 pickups of 2020. Uh, this last year, obviously a huge debacle uh, with the pandemic going on. Conventions definitely slowed down or halted altogether. So buying, selling, collecting those big key issues was put on a hold or at least a, a slowdown. Uh, thanks to the great community that we have on Instagram and YouTube, however, uh, I was able to further my PC beyond what I thought uh, that I that I could I, I couldn't even imagine uh, that I could get some of these books honestly I got so many so many great books this year it was really hard for me to narrow down a top 10 uh, but enough of the chitter chatter let's jump straight into it coming in at number 10 we have X-Men 12 at a 6.5 CGC with off-white to white pages this is the origin of Professor X as well as the first appearance of Kane Marco better known as the juggernaut it's also the first mention of the Sidorak, whose red uh, ruby gem, or crimson gem, is actually what uh, creates the monster known as Juggernaut. So in this issue, it describes Charles and Kane's relationship when they were children. Kane was Charles' older stepbrother who turned out to be a cruel tormentor to Charles. When they were older, they enlisted in the military and were sent off to Korea. Kane ends up deserting and stumbles upon the long lost temple of Sidorak. Despite desperate warnings from Charles, he snatches up a crimson gem that was left by an altar and transforms into the monster he is best known as, the Juggernaut. This is an incredible story from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. It was published in July of 1965 and is easily a very defining issue in the X-Men run. I think that it is a super important issue and a kind of slept on issue as well, especially with how many times the movie studios reached to use Juggernaut as a villain. If and when the X-Men are reintroduced into the uh, MCU, it's not out of reach that they would use a similar story to establish Charles and Kane as Fox established Magneto and Wolverine through war stories. All right, number nine on my list. That's gonna be Fantastic Four number six. This one, graded by CGC at a 3.5 with off-white to white pages. It is the first Marvel villain team-up. Also, second appearance of Doctor Doom and second appearance of the Silver Age Submariner. This issue is bonkers for a multitude of reasons. It is the first mention of the Yancey Street Gang, even though the gang itself doesn't actually make an appearance for another nine issues. It explores the power of the Fantastic Four's super suits and how they're made from unstable molecules. Namor during these early appearances was able to mimic abilities of other sea life, such as discharging electricity like an electric eel. The Baxter Building is officially named and Doom's armor continues to evolve to what Kirby finally develops into his classic outfit. And also, did I mention Doom? One of the most BA villains in Marvel and maybe ever makes his second appearance to torment Marvel's beloved family, accompanied temporarily by Namor before the Submariner realizes the kind of deceit and deception that he's dealing with. Another masterpiece from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, this hits my list simply because it is the closest thing to an FF5 that I can get right now. Doom prices are skyrocketing, and by association, his second appearance climbs along with it. I'm not sure if the MCU would use Doom as a big bad, but in my opinion, he would be perfect to incorporate. He is one of the most brilliant scientists on Earth, and the magic slash sorcerer aspect that he brings to the table makes him perfect to introduce into a Doctor Strange movie. But if not there, he is also known to battle cosmic beings, so it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to cameo him in a Guardians of the Galaxy or Thor movie as well. I have high hopes to see Doctor Doom done correctly on the big screen. Let's move on to number eight on my list. That's gonna be Fantastic Four, number 52, graded by CGC at a 5.0 with off-white pages. This grail is the first appearance of Wakanda's King T'Challa, the Black Panther. In this story, the Fantastic Four are invited to the mysterious African nation Wakanda, but when they land, they find themselves attacked by the Black Panther. Caught off guard, they are each individually overpowered by the Panther, but when they join together, they finally overpower him. T'Challa then reveals that he was only testing the four to make sure that they are up for a terrible task. 
If you haven't noticed a trend here, this story was written by Stan Lee with artwork by Jack Kirby. Black Panther was undoubtedly one of the best movies Marvel has put out yet, and that is made obvious by all of the records it continued to smash in the box office. Chadwick Boseman was truly an inspiration and a legend, and he is gone from us far too soon. I don't think I want to see another Black Panther movie without him in it. I'm glad that I secured this book in my personal collection this year, not because of any kind of speculation, but because I believe it is truly an important part of Marvel history. All right, number seven on my list. This is where it started to get hard to narrow it down, but I chose Amazing Spider-Man number 300, signed by Todd McFarlane, the Todd father, baby. This one graded 9.4 with white pages, uh, also notable about this book is that it's a newsstand, meaning it has a bar uh, or a, a barcode instead of uh, instead of the direct editions. Um, that means that it was sold by uh, like comic newsstands or stores that weren't specifically comic shops. The direct editions went straight to stores that were uh, primarily comic book selling shops. This, of course, is the first appearance and full origin of the Venom, Eddie Brock. Uh, it is also the last time that Peter dons the black costume, at least for a little while. Uh, and it is one of the most iconic and most replicated covers in Marvel history, uh, including the very next issue with Amazing Spider-Man 301, but we all know how much Todd McFarlane thinks of himself and likes to uh, pay homage to his own, uh, his own covers. Uh, he's constantly doing that. What can I say about this issue that you don't already know? This is a grail level book from David Michelini and Todd McFarlane because Venom is one of the most well-known villains in Spider-Man's rogue gallery. The Venom origin is generally known, even though the exact details have been altered in any movie or cartoon format. Eddie was a journalist who developed adrenal cancer and when he found out he only had months to live, he wanted to break a big story about a serial killer named the Sin Eater. He was given false information and wrote an exclusive article to expose the killer as Emil Gregg for the Daily Globe. Even though the paper sold out immediately, that same day Spider-Man revealed the Sin Eater to be Detective Stan Carter, which made Brock a laughingstock. He was fired, Anne left him, his father disowned him, etc, etc. Brock blamed all of his problems on Spider-Man and became obsessed. Sometime later, he was actually about to commit suicide when the symbiote that Spider-Man shed bonded with him and that is what started one of the greatest supervillains of all time. Now, did you know? Originally, when David Michelini was creating a new character to be bonded with the symbiote, he was going to have the character be a woman. The origin was set to be about a woman who was pregnant and about to give birth, so her husband tried to get a taxi for them. The taxi driver was distracted by a sighting of Spider-Man and ran over the husband, killing him, which caused the woman to go into labor, lose the baby, and go crazy. She would then blame Spider-Man and have a deep hatred for him, and that would be the revenge and hatred the symbiote would bond to. That is why, in Web of Spider-Man 18 and Web of Spider-Man 24, the hands that push Peter Parker uh, in front of a train or grab his ankle while he's climbing up a wall uh, resemble a woman's hands. Uh, this idea, of course, was rejected by the editor at the time in a sweeping sexist declaration that women aren't threatening enough to make a serious supervillain. Number six on my list is going to have to be Boom! Amazing Spider-Man number nine, graded by CGC at a 3.5 with white pages. This is the origin and first appearance of Electro. This is on my list because it is the first single digit Amazing Spider-Man book that I have owned. I'm super excited to have this major key, especially since there are talks about Jamie Foxx reprising his role as Electro for the upcoming movie. Max Dillon is one of the members of the Sinister Six and an overall badass in the lineup of Spidey's foes. Stan Lee, of course, the writer of this one, and Steve Ditko on the cover and art. And even though it certainly isn't one of my favorite Ditko covers, it's an absolute must have for any Spider-Man collection. Number five on my list. Ah, yes, the age old debate continues. Is it or is it not the first appearance of the Wolverine? I'm talking, of course, about the Incredible Hulk number 180, and mine is graded by CGC at a 7.5 with white pages. Now, the story itself focuses on Hulk's battle with the Wendigo in Canada, and it isn't until the very last panel when Wolverine steps on the scene to join the Tangle. Now, the debate, of course, is long winded and heated. Is it a cameo or is it his first full appearance? Uh, I'm going to give you my personal opinion, which of course is just an opinion and can be argued and could be completely wrong altogether. 
A cameo to me is if you see a part of a character, like in the shadows or hiding, and they don't have any lines, or if they do have lines spoken, it doesn't really reveal too much. Now in Hulk 180, in the last panel, you get a full body shot of Wolverine, broad daylight from head to toe. He has two lines and identifies himself in big red letters as the Wolverine. There's also a text box that identifies him as Weapon X, and he is referred to as Weapon X earlier in the story by a military commander. For all of these reasons, I truly believe that this is the first appearance of the Wolverine. Yes, 181 has a better cover, which is why I'm sure it's recognized as the first appearance. And yes, 181 has been adopted and pump and dumped by certain comic groups. Mm, that part may be unbeknownst to you uh, to reach the super expensive prices it has hit. But to me, the first appearance will always be 180. But enough of the arguments, this story was done by Len Wein and Herb Trimp did the cover and interior artwork. I'm very glad I was able to obtain uh, this copy in my collection and it is actually the first book I have bought for $500 or more. So that was certainly a milestone in my collecting path. Narrowing it down even further, may I present number four on my list and that's going to be Werewolf by Night number 32. This one graded by CGC at a 6.0 with off-white pages. This is the first appearance and origin of Mark Spector, the Moon Knight. This book has been on top list for decades and was for a while the most expensive first appearance without a TV show or movie including the character. That's insane. Now of course we know uh, we will be seeing Spectre and his multiple identities portrayed by Oscar Isaac on a brand new Disney Plus streaming show. I'm super excited for this show and I hope it is as dark and grisly as they can get away with. This book, written by Doug Mensch, is a good old fashioned horror tale where Moon Knight decks it out with Jack the Werewolf. Now, did you know in this issue they spell Mark Spector's name with a K, but in all subsequent appearances, Spector spells his first name with a C, like a moon. Also, the first time you ever see any mention of Moon Knight is in Werewolf by Night 31, where on the final page it spells out Moon Knight in an advert for the next issue. Spectre moves from Werewolf by Night 32 and 33 to Marvel Spotlight 28 and 29 before finally getting his own series five years later in Moon Knight number one in 1980. Top three, here we go. My number three pickup from 2020 is going to have to be Amazing Spider-Man Annual number one and this one graded at a 4.0 by CGC with white pages. This book uh, has over doubled in value since I picked it up early last year and really there's only one reason for that It is the first appearance of the Sinister Six The original Sinister Six was comprised of Dr. Octopus, Electro, Craven, Mysterio, Sandman, and the Vulture The group is gathered by Dr. Octopus fresh out of prison and his thinking is that each of them almost defeated Spider-Man alone So naturally if they all team up, there's no way that the webhead can defeat them this is a big fun action packed story by Stan Lee with Steve Ditko on the art. The Sinister Six coming to the big screen? Is that what Sony has been trying to put together? With Sony doing villain standalone movies and with the villains chosen so far for the Spider-Man movies, speculators are wildly guessing that we may see a group team up soon. If it's done correctly, I think it would be an absolutely epic event and I'm sure other comic fans share my enthusiasm there especially if it happens to include a hobgoblin. Oh, please. Number two, we're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. My number two pickup for the year of 2020 is Amazing Spider-Man number 15, graded by CGC at a 5.5 with off-white to white pages. This book is, of course, the first appearance of Kraven the Haunter. It's also the second appearance of Chameleon, who we haven't seen since Amazing Spider-Man number one. And it's the first mention of Mary Jane Watson, uh, who we don't get a cameo of until ASM 25, and then doesn't really fully appear until ASM 42. Now that's a build up. This is hands down one of the best Ditko covers and a fun story from Stan the Man. We don't get too much of an origin here, but Craven basically organizes a bank robbery using the chameleon to study Spidey's fighting style and then squares up against him. Spider-Man, having been poisoned and weakened, retreats and tries again. He fights Craven in a forest and defeats him, except not really because that turns out to be the chameleon again. But finally, Parker beats down the real Craven and he is deported while swearing his revenge. Now, did you know? that this story is later retold from the perspective of Craven in the 1996 annual of Sensational Spider-Man. 
Also, this cover is one of the 32 that appear in the comic collection from the 2000 Spider-Man video game. Kraven is such an iconic villain, but unfortunately he doesn't have that very many appearances. He is only in somewhere between 50 and 100 comics, which makes his first appearance all the more special to me. Of course, there was a lot of talk from Sony about producing a solo movie featuring this member of the Sinister Six, and if they do, I truly hope it is to bring to life the story of Kraven's Last Hunt, which is one of my favorite Spider-Man stories that exists. And finally, drum roll please. My number one pickup from 2020 is one of the all-time grails of Marvel collecting. I'm talking about Fantastic Four number 48. And this one, graded by CGC at a 4.0 with white pages. This is the first appearance of Silver Surfer and the first Galactus cameo on the last page. And holy cow, I can't believe I have this one in my collection. It's so funny that in 2019, I saw this book at a few cons on the walls and I thought to myself, man, I probably won't ever own that book. Now, one year later, you don't ever see them on the wall at conventions or at least the small ones that are still happening. And I have five of them in my possession. It's crazy how things can flip. Now, Silver Surfer has been a longtime favorite of mine. I remember when I was a kid, I had the fantasy masterpiece reprints of the first four Silver Surfer books, and I literally read them until the covers fell right off of them. A tragic love story background, Norrin Rad finds himself hunting for planets for his master Galactus to devour. Even though the Watcher tries to interfere by hiding Earth with space debris, the Surfer investigates and finds Earth. He of course lands right on the Baxter building, what are the chances of that, and sends his signal out for Galactus, who then appears on the last page declaring his intention to devour Earth. Did you know that Norn Rad gave up his life and freedom to stop Galactus from devouring his own planet, Zen La? He was trying, of course, to protect his love, Shalabal, and the intelligence of the planet. Galactus accepts his plea and makes a deal for Norn to become his new herald and constantly search for planets for him to consume in exchange for the safety of his home planet. Of course, Galactus ended up having to suppress Rad's emotions and memories when he didn't want to bring Galactus to any planets with sentient life. This issue is the first time that the Watcher violates his oath of non-interference, which was put into effect when the Watchers accidentally caused the mass extension of the Prosilicans when they provided them with nuclear technology. As far as Galactus goes, he is widely considered a villain, but really, he is just a product of the universe. Originally named Galen, he is the sole survivor of the sixth incarnation of the multiverse. After the Big Bang, energy matter transformed him into Galactus, and he consumes worlds out of a necessity to stay alive, and also for universal balance. The imagination of Stan Lee is truly showcased throughout this issue and the ones that follow. It is among my all-time favorite, and whether or not Silver Surfer and his world-eating master rumble into the MCU, this book will be long cherished in my personal collection. So what do you think of my list? Hopefully 2021 continues to provide even more awesome finds and I can continue to impress you uh, with a new list next year. What were your favorite pickups of 2020? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, don't forget to subscribe. And since I'm a new YouTube channel, let me know if you have uh, content that I should subscribe to as well. Don't forget to check out my merchandise shop. The link is in the uh, description down below. Uh, it really helps to uh, support the show it, just by buying a t-shirt or hoodie or other awesome apparel and swag that I've got on my shop. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, stay villainous.